weather. What kind of shirt are you wearing? Uh, in today's presentation, this is a bit different than, than others. We're not directly dealing with the survival of trees or anything directly like that. But um, banks are really an important element in our society and who they choose and to, to uh, loan to and do transactions for, et cetera, et cetera, is an important aspect of, of our lives. So uh, Jake Tomville approached me a month or two ago about giving a presentation on yeah, both the industry as a whole, but also some specifics about his desire to form a, a, a what you call it, a community bank? A public bank. Public bank in, in, uh, in our county, one way or another. Uh, so I thank you. Uh, there's snacks here. I think the lighting seems to be okay. You want me to darken it or lighten it? Okay, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Gary. Um, so again, my name is Jake Tonkel, and I got involved in what we would like to call as a, a public banking movement after the Dakota Access Pipeline ordeal. So I was in Standing Rock for a week volunteering um, out there, and upon coming back home, started to really look into environmental divestment, so divestment of my own personal finance from fossil fuels. Going through my 401k, which I don't have very much in there, so it makes it easy. I don't own a home, so I don't need to change a home loan over. And, and was very quickly able to hit a wall at what I could do with my own finances to make an impact, and started to turn to something else. So what came out of it was cities beginning to divest. As people took their own actions and became empowered, Cities like Seattle, like Oakland, um, San Francisco all started to look at how they could divest their um, budgets and their pension funds, et cetera, from some of these banks that were funding fossil fuel pipelines and as you dig deeper, you know, creating environmental destruction across the board. So everyone started to come into a place where if you don't have a credit union that's available to you, which credit unions are generally small and wouldn't support hundreds of millions, billions of dollars, what do you do? And public banking pulled its head around from something that wasn't talked about for almost 100 years. The Bank of North Dakota is the longest standing public bank in the United States. It's owned by the government of North Dakota and it holds their state money. So a public bank is a chartered depository in where public funds are deposited. It's owned by a government entity, that could be a state, it could be a county, it could be a city, it could be a board of education, uh, any of the water district, any government entity could potentially own a public bank. When they choose to or not choose to is more dependent on how much money they can save and whether it's feasible. When a public entity runs anything, it moves itself away from a mandate of simply making profit and towards a public good. You have to justify why this is good for our community, why this is good for our students, our parents, our children, uh, the environment. How are we going to see this return, not just in dollars, but in community benefit. Again, people like to think when you mention a bank that's run by the government that it's gonna be run by you know, government employees. The gridlock that we have in Washington or even to some people's understanding in Sacramento that politicians tend to make things slow and possibility for corruption. This is still a bank run by bankers. So this hope is that you give someone with a degree in finance, with experience running a bank itself, the opportunity to make decisions not just based off of profit, but based off of community benefit. Gary touched on it a little bit. Banking is important. 
It's how we have decided we're going to determine what economic activity in our communities is positive or negative. And right now, we're only using profit to analyze that. Banks also provide a service by creating money. How do you create money? You print it? Print it? Now it's done electronically. Yeah. So if I put $100 into a bank, they can loan out $90 based off of the Federal Reserve requirement. And while my bank account still says 100 when I check it online, somebody else's bank account that got a $90 loan says $90. While the bank didn't print anything, they just changed some numbers online, and now $90 was created, the sum total uh, in the economy available for spending is $190. And when you aggregate that over people, you know, the state of California, the United States, you can create a lot of money and you essentially diversify that risk, right? Uh, in some ways, if me and the person that had $90 of mine ask for all of it at one time, that's when you run into a problem. But you diversify it over groups of people in a healthy economy, and that doesn't happen. A public bank would benefit us by taking what money we don't have control of now, that we give to a private for-profit bank to hold. Generally, we pay them hundreds of millions of dollars, depending on the size of the public entity, to manage that money. And then they take that money, they loan it however they see fit, and they make as much profit as they possibly can. So by taking the money that we put in these banks and putting it in our own institution, we can start to leverage the same abilities that we give a private bank, the same privileges that they have to create money that doesn't exist, to decide who gets a loan for their house or for their student loans, etc., for their small business, and we can start to have some control over that as a community. We can put democracy back in our monetary system by saying we know that money and profit aren't the only reasons that you would want to give someone money, and we know that not everyone can afford to take money if you're going to pull as much as you humanly can from them in order to line your own pockets for your shareholders. So a public bank is not a private bank, it's not a community bank, it's not a credit bank. It shares some similarities and has some distinct differences. So a public bank, its entire mandate is that it serves the public interest. The money it makes from loans actually comes back into the public pool. So say the bank makes 3%, off of a loan that it gives to a school. That school is paying money not to some bank that's gonna put it in other funds overseas or some shareholder's pocket that's gonna hide it offshore in the Canary Islands. That money is just gonna go back to the county. It's gonna go back to the city for leverage so that we can loan it out somewhere else. So in one way, you're able to reduce the amount that someone would have to pay in interest if you're loaning to yourself or another government entity that has a public mandate, their interest rate goes down. And at the same time, all of that interest stays within our community. Private owned banks, responsible only to their shareholders, all the money they make gets siphoned out of our community, or most of it. The public bank still engages in refraction, fractional reserve lending. It still can ex extend credit and make loans, it can accept deposits, and it can borrow to meet unmet reserves. And that's one of the interesting things that all banks that have an account uh, in the Fed can borrow if they're short for the day. And they borrow it, I think, 0.2%, which is really low. Most of us don't even make 0.2% on our um, savings accounts, but we get charged 6% for our car loans. All depends on your wealth, and it's then backloaded onto the poorest of us, because they're ended up 
in a higher risk scenario where they're charged more interest. Theoretically, it's non-profit. It, the public but bank is essentially a non-profit, yeah. but you would want to make sure that you're covering yeah. what obligations you have in the future. The reserve. Right. Mm -hmm. So we have three main examples in the U.S. I talked about the Bank of North Dakota. Its original foundation was actually a very interesting story. So agriculture um, and farmers in the early 1900s realized that Wall Street banks were really screwing them over. They were consolidating their land, forcing them to move to cities because they were the ones that were charging them interest uh, for the opportunity for them to expand their production, to get new technology, to implement uh, new farming techniques, to buy seed. And they kind of staged a revolt. And what they came up with was, we as an agricultural state want to be able to provide loans to our neighbors using our excess money and not have it go abroad, not have it go outside the state of North Dakota. And they've been really successful. So over the last 100 years, they've turned $300 million into the state's general fund. So the state has made money off of their bank that they get to then loan out to the rest of their community. The two more recent examples are the Chickasaw Nation. It's called Bank Two. So a, a tribe, its own, in theory, its own government entity, created a bank to serve its population that was being underserved by traditional for-profit banking. They differ from the Bank of North Dakota in some ways where they provide home loans, they provide more direct banking services to their community, and they've also been really successful. So since 2002, they've gone from 7.5 million to 135 million in assets. Just making local community loans, and that is through the 2008 financial crash when most banks that were community banks took a really big hit. They were able to stay solvent because they weren't also trying to invest in Wall Street. They were investing in their neighbors, in their community, and it creates a real stable economic situation. And more recently, we kind of have the capitalist head in for-profit banking. The island of American Samoa had only one private bank servicing it across the island. It was the Bank of Hawaii, which is not a public bank, it's a private bank. When the Bank of Hawaii said, this isn't profitable for us, we're losing money by providing services on this island, and they left. So, when they well, left... Um, they didn't make commercial loans. There's no business on the island. No, so that's kind of the, the problem here, right? So, in 2012, when their private, the private bank pulled out, yeah. there was no one to make loans. No commercial. There was no bank, so people couldn't go anywhere to ask for a loan. They didn't have a place to deposit their money. So for almost six years, they ran on almost entirely on a cash economy. It really hurt their ability to grow as an island because in order to make a productive economic growth, you need to have loans. You need to have people that can move their money from one place to another or invest. And that's really hard to do without a bank. So just last year, the island decided they were going to create their own public bank to solve this issue. But the United States is not the only place that has had public bank and had success with public banking. A lot of the growth attributed to some of the BRIC countries, so Brazil, India, Russia, China, is because they also implement a public banking strategy as part of their um, social, capitalistic, quasi-economies. And so only about 40% of all the banks in the world, all the money owned, is actually in public banks. Where is the local public bank? Do we have a public bank here? That's why I'm talking to you, is we're trying to make it happen. Oh, okay. All right. So it's been out of the conversation in the United States for a long time. I 
just getting involved with this last year, I didn't know that there was a Bank of North Dakota that was a publicly run entity. Yeah. What is BRIC? It's BRIC. So it's a term that means Brazil, India, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And they're. Do understand what? The letters? What's BRIC? Brazil, B. Brazil? Russia, mm -hmm. R. Okay. India, I. And China, C. So BRIC. It, in geopolitical terms is, are the countries that kind of tend to go counter to what the US and the EU are doing in certain strategies. And so they kind of have a, a bit of a partnership in developing their own financial models, which implement public banking, because the US has traditionally done a lot of work through the IMF and the World Bank to coordinate how developing nations grow in order to cultivate our own corporate interests. That's it, my take on it anyway. Um, I work in China, you walk down the street and every bank is a public bank. There's the Bank of Agriculture, the Bank of Construction, the Bank of China, and it's allowed them to grow their middle class much more strongly than we have while providing food and services in rural places. Right? The bank understands that agriculture is still something that they need and it's not always going to be the most profitable, but it creates stability for their economy. So how do we create meaningful change? Here what we right? The divestment movement was huge and it's still growing and people are still acting on how do I divest my own money personally? How do my, does my money share my value? So over 700,000 people divested worldwide after the defund Apple campaign. $6.24 trillion was pledged to be divested from different institutions, public, private, nonprofit. Um, it's a lot of money. And it, if America stands for anything, it stands for the fact that money talks. The problem is, not everything in our economy is valued in the same way or looked at by a bank in the same way. So we, as a community, are already paying for the cost of climate change. We as a globe, as a, as a human race, are already paying for things that other people are profiting off of. Right? The expansion of fossil fuels, the use of fossil fuels is devastating communities all over the world. And that economic impact does not go back to the people that are creating it. Even in California, a place that's extremely wealthy, that has resources, technology, educated population, is still going to be devastated by climate change if we don't make changes to the way that our system works. And every year that we wait, implementing the solutions gets more expensive, and coming back from the disasters gets more expensive. All of our systems are at risk from climate change, whether it's transportation, whether it's agriculture, whether it's education, whether it's technology. If we don't have an environment that's functioning, that's healthy, that creates, that keeps people safe, then they can go off and do the other things that people will say you know, makes the United States uh, an amazing place to live. And so the problem hasn't really necessarily been that we're looking to scientists for a solution. There are a lot of proposals out there that say if we just spent the money and did it in the right way, that we would have vast improvements in the way that we're fighting the climate crisis. Things that we tend not to do because we ask how we're going to pay for them. Implementing transportation overhaul, providing solar to low income neighbors, getting people off the roads and onto their bikes, making lanes commuter friendly. Right? All of these things, switching over our agriculture system from monoculture to polyculture and etc. All of those things take 
massive societal collaboration. And it's not that we're not smart enough, it's that people are stuck based off of the monetary incentives that keep them fed, that bring their, you know, keep their children in schools and good education plans, so they don't have time to take a pay cut to do something that they might care about or that's more fulfilling. Santa Clara County has its own set of problems. It's not all, not all of them are unique, but what they share is that they all take money to solve. The number one issue that's changed in Santa Clara County over the last 10 years has been housing. I think we all feel that. Building low-income housing, building extremely low-income housing is something that, again, we ask, how are you going to pay for that? Transportation, all the traffic, implementing light rail structures that are actually usable, that run on time, that have enough um, op frequency that people are willing to take them. Making roads bicycle friendly. Right? My boss works two miles from where he lives. He's got two daughters, and he can't afford to get hit by a car. It just, that's it, what he told me. He's an avid mountain biker, and he won't bike to work because the infrastructure is not there. And this happens for most of us all the time. When, you're, when we understand what the climate crisis really needs, the decisions that we make come down to the fact that we can't afford to do them ourselves, not that we don't want to, because everyone in this room wants to make those decisions, and we want to make those decisions easier, and that costs money. Combating homelessness is a huge upfront loaded cost, right? We pay over $520 million as a county every year for the result of homelessness. If you do 